<laughs> well, that, that one was fun. I like, I, like, I like that whole process. And it fits oddly with the text we're going we're gonna to work on today. Uh, we're going to look at a story. It comes out of Luke's Gospel, chapter 12. And the topic today is climbing the right ladder of the gospel and success. Luke 12, verse 16. And then he told them this parable. This is Jesus telling one of his uh, stories with a spiritual point. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Interesting parable, uh, hard-hitting parable. We're studying the Bible this year uh, through the lens of our work, and that's the point of the whole curriculum this year, driven seeing God's work and your work. And so I want to talk about three things today out of this parable through the lens of work. First, the gospel clarifies our values. The gospel clarifies our values. Uh, we all know through the ad campaigns that have already started uh, that the, the, the Olympics in Sochi are almost here. As I mentioned in the email that I sent out this week, if you read it, uh, I kind of have mixed feelings about the Olympics. Uh, I'm really not interested personally uh, in sports like bobsledding or curling or that one where they cross-country ski and shoot stuff. I don't know what that's called. It looks like it might be fun, but it depends on what you're, I guess, what you're shooting at. Um, but I know, even though I'm not interested, I don't really care, uh, I know that Bob Costas is going to make me watch. He's going to be on 24-7. He's going to be in my home. By the end of the Olympics, he's going to be like one of our family members, and he's going to just suck me in. I know it's going to happen. There are going to be story after story of athletes who've trained 10 hours a day for their whole lives for just one chance to win a gold medal. I'm just a sucker for stories like that. It's going to suck me in. And those stories always make me think about a survey I read about several years ago. Uh, back in the 1980s or so, when East German women all looked like Kyle Long, um, there was a bunch of studies being done about, you've got to think about that for a second, um, the, the, a bunch of studies were done on the impact of steroids in sports and all that, and a researcher named Bob Goldman began surveying elite athletes, Olympic-level athletes. His main interest was to find out whether elite athletes would be willing to take a drug that guaranteed them a gold medal, but would cost them their life within five years of that success. It's called the Goldman Dilemma. Uh, when he dis what he discovered was this. When presented with a question, would you take a drug that would guarantee a gold medal, but would cause you to lose your life within five years, would you do it? More than half of the elite athletes responded to that survey, yes, they would make that trade. They would take the drug, even if it meant early death, so long as they won a gold medal. And he repeated that survey roughly every two years for over a decade, and every time he did it, for elite athletes, they gave the same response. About half of them were willing to do it. And that's really a question about values. What's a gold medal worth? What price is an athlete willing to pay for that particular accomplishment? And then the, the next question that we, we have to ask is, what about us? What price are we willing to pay what price am I willing to pay? What price are we paying right now for the things that we regard as important? Because everyone has a worldview. Everyone has a value system, whether or not they can articulate it. We, we will pay in money, time, attention, passion. We will pay whatever we think something is worth. We're all capitalists at heart. Uh, I'll drive, for example, four hours each way, to watch my son play in a basketball game because my value system says that's worth it. Another guy might spend $5,000 on two Super Bowl tickets for he and a buddy to go because his value system says that's worth it. We don't put our money where our mouth is. We put our money, our time, our energy, our lives where our values are. If you want to know where your values are, just trace it back to where your time, money, and attention goes. Think about Alex Rodriguez, for example, baseball star. He's been in the news the last week or so, actually for a long time. His story is uniquely interesting. By the time Alex Rodriguez was 17 years old, he was one of the most gifted baseball players in the world at age 17. He made the major leagues before his 19th birthday. He was playing in the big leagues. By the time he was 25, he had a contract worth $250 million. He was the youngest player to reach 500 home runs in his career. And yet... 
he wanted to build bigger barns. His goal was 800 home runs, the first ever to reach 800 home runs. And so he made a decision. Alex Rodriguez sacrificed his integrity, his reputation, and risk his career and probably his health by choosing performance-enhancing drugs. Because his value system said that hitting 800 home runs was worth it. And now he's bearing the consequences of those decisions. We all have a value system. And in the gospel, God shares his value system with us. 1 Peter 1.19, for example, the Apostle Paul writes, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. Now that's a summary of the gospel, but it also tells us something about the value of a human being. According to the gospel, nothing is more valuable than a human soul. Not all the gold in Fort Knox, if there's any actually there. Not all the combined wealth of the ten richest people in the world. Not a World Series victory for the Cubs, although that might be close. Uh, no nothing is as valuable as a single human soul. Because only a human soul is eternal. Created to be eternal. And a human soul is the only thing God was willing to pay for with his own blood with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, somewhere within us, whether or not we're men of faith, we know that that value system is true. Somewhere in us, we know that. We know that things like child abuse and sex trafficking are obscenely immoral. We know that somewhere deep in us. Whatever we believe about God, we know that. And that's because those things violate the essential value of a human soul. They, value the, they, they violate the value system of God himself. In Tim Keller's book, uh, Every Good Endeavor, which we, I think, still maybe have a copy over there, uh, he tells of an obscure movie that I've not seen, but I might actually look it up. An obscure mu movie made by a Vietnamese filmmaker who may or may not be a Christian that tells the story of a working-class man named Hai who is infatuated with an ambitious prostitute and the prostitute is a young woman who dreams about sleeping her way out of poverty and into the upper class world of these luxury hotels that she sees all around her. Hai wins some money and uses it to pay for a night with this particular prostitute. He rents a room in a luxury hotel, but instead of having sex, he simply asks to watch her fall asleep in the bed in the luxury ho hotel room. Uh, and he does. He watches her rest in the world she dreams of living in someday, but does not demand to have sex with her. In the morning, he's gone. But in the movie, as they tell the story, something in the young woman changes. She can't go back to her, whole, her old life. She's transformed by a love that values her simply for herself. And that's what's missing from this guy in Jesus' story, the bigger Barnes guy. His value system, if we read the story, is based on what? His value system is based on his work, his career, his material wealth, my material wealth, my bigger barns. More is better. Bigger is better. Not a hint of gospel value in his heart as we see the story. And that's why Jesus issues the stern warning, a surprisingly stern warning. When you first read it, it almost seems unfair. He says, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with everyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. But if we dig into the story and we see Scripture in its whole, we see that Jesus is not saying it's wrong to work. He's not. He's not saying that it's wrong to work for profit. He's not. He's not saying that it's even necessarily wrong to build bigger barns. What he is saying is that if bigger barns are your value system, if your work and your barns are divorced from God's value system, that's a very dangerous place to be, he's saying. That leads us to the second point today. The gospel then defines true success. The gospel helps us define true success. Everyone has a working definition of success. Again, whether or not we can articulate it. Uh, we may not even be able to, to say it in one sentence. We may not be aware of it most days. But most of us have an idea what success is. And for most of us in this room, it has to do with our work. Now, we know that marriage and family and kids and God are important. But when we define success, for most of us, uh, most of us it comes down to our work. Because success is being good at what you do. Success is being rewarded for being good at what you do. Success is climbing the ladder. Success is achievement. Success is earning a promotion, earning a raise, earning a corner office. Success 
like the guy in the story, is bigger barns. And in that way, Jesus' ancient parable is extremely contemporary today. It speaks to us. Now, if you're like me, you break success down into sort of bite-sized chunks to manage your life. What do I have to do today to be successful? What do I have to do this week to be successful, this month, this year? And we all do that in some way or another. But if we limit our definition of success to our work, then we become a lot like the bigger Barnes guy. This story tells us that success is being rich toward God. That's the phrase Jesus uses. Be rich toward God. Now what does that mean? He doesn't really define it in the story. Well, let's go back to God's value system. What does God care about? What do we know from the Bible that God cares about? We used to see a reminder of this, by the way, uh, every weekend watching NFL football games. Remember, there used to be that guy in the rainbow wig holding the sign, John 316, up behind the goalpost? Almost every NFL game. I don't know how the guy got around, but he did. Now, I haven't seen him as much recently, uh, but, but he used to be out there. And that was a reminder of God's value system because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God cares about the eternal destiny of every human soul. It's God's value system. By the way, um, a few years ago, my brother Joe, who's a pastor in Ohio, told me a, a story that I still laugh about in my quiet moments because I know my brother. Uh, he told me that after he preached his heart out in some sermon some Sunday, a woman approached him right after the sermon, right down in front of the platform, and told him through tears that her pet dog had died that week. And that's fine, because he could have compassion, he could be, pray with her, something. But, but then she asked him, Pastor Joe, will I get to see Fluffy again in heaven? Whatever the dog's name was. Will I get to see my dog again in heaven? And you need to know something about my brother. He's a great guy. Wonderful pastor, great with people, good sense of humor, but he doesn't suffer fools very well. He's not a terribly patient guy, especially not right after he preached a sermon. Before he could really think about how to answer that question diplomatically, and there's a way to do it, he blurted out, Barb, you're not going to see Fluffy in heaven. Jesus didn't die on the cross for your dog sins. And it kind of degenerated from there, and... <laughs> He wishes he could get that one back, but you really can't at that point in time. Now, obviously, we know through Scripture, front to back, that God cares about us. He cares about all aspects of our lives, knows every hair on our head, and he cares mostly about people, though. He cares about the condition of our souls, about our eternal destiny. So what is success, then, to come back to the question? Well, when Jesus was asked one time by um, someone listening to him teach, what is the greatest commandment? What does God want most from us? Here's what Jesus said, Matthew 22, 38. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, loving God must be part of our definition of success. That's what Jesus said, God's value system. And loving neighbor is right alongside loving people. People at home, people in your neighborhood, people on the train, people on the road. That's a really hard one. People at work, people your work touches. And this definition of success, the Bible tells us, can change the way we do and see our work. Which leads us to the third point today. The gospel anchors our work in eternity. The gospel anchors our work in in eternity. Uh, Tim Keller tells the story of uh, Milton Hershey, who founded the Hershey Chocolate Company in 1903. His innovation, which changed the world of chocolate, was putting milk into chocolate. Nobody had done that before. Uh, and he put milk into a chocolate bar. The company took off. People loved his new chocolate. And the dairy farmers in Pennsylvania loved Milton Hershey. Changed the whole industry. Then, some years later, the Great Depression hits. Business falls apart. But Hershey, by this time, had become quite wealthy through his innovation of the chocolate bar. He refused during the Great Depression to lay off his employees, even though they stopped making chocolate because people weren't buying it. Instead, he created his own public works projects in that town where the business was located. People built houses, amusement parks, all that kind of stuff. And toward the end of his life, he and his wife then founded a boarding school for orphans. They had no children of their own. But they founded a boarding school and funded it through company stock. So that is funded to this day, long after his death. 
That's because Hershey believed, I don't know what his spiritual stance was, but he believed that his prophet was to have a purpose beyond bigger barns. That's what he believed, and he lived that out. Tim Keller says, work is a major instrument of God's providence. It's how he sustains the human world. Work is the major instrument of God's providence. It's how he sustains the human world. Hershey understood that. Remember, according to God's value system, there is no secular work. There is no honest, legitimate work that is separated from God's work in the world. Jesus is saying through this story that a definition of success that ignores the gospel is empty and dangerous. A set of values that ignores God is a recipe for disaster. Now, in his essay, The Weight of Glory, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote decades ago, and I'll, I, I've shortened this a bit, and it's hard to listen to because his language is very flowery, but I'll summarize it at the end. He writes, It's a serious thing to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in the light of these overwhelming possibilities that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another. There are no ordinary people. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. In other words, the way we live our lives, the value system we adopt, the way we do our work, the way we understand our work, the way we treat our neighbor, all conspires together to help every person we touch, every person we meet, every person who our work touches move one step closer to God and eternity with Him or pushes them one step further from God and closer to an eternity without Him. That's what C.S. Lewis was saying. There is no neutral work. There is no neutral interaction with another human being. Here's the questions I want you to deal with around the table today. First, how did you define success at certain points in your life as you grew and matured? And I've just put up here by the decades. How did you define success at 20, at 30, at 40, and if you're old enough, at 50? Secondly, in what ways have you been like the bigger barns guy in terms of your values and your approach to work? Do you have any commonalities with him? When you read that story, do you kind of go, ooh, that seems kind of harsh because something in you says, re re resonates with that. Thirdly, if you, get, if you get there, how might the values of the gospel shape how you think about and how you pursue and do your work? Let's take a break, get some coffee, come back, I'll wrap you up right before 7 o'clock. <laughs>